مساء الخير واهلا بكم الى حلقه جديده من برنامج واشنطن اونلاين معي انا هديل عويس على نورث بريس هل تحرك مظاهرات السويداء المياه الراكده في الساحه السوريه خاصه بعد اعتراف راس النظام السوري بشار الاسد بشكليه عوده دمشق الى جامعه الدول العربيه كيف ستتعامل واشنطن مع هذه المستجدات وما هو مستقبل الحراك في السويداء ابحث هذا الموضوع اليوم مع ضيفي لهذه الحلقه وهما بروفيسور ديفيد ليش الباحث في السياسات الخارجيه الامريكيه ينضم الينا من واشنطن ابقوا معنا لمتابعه هذه الحلقه ابدا الان مع ضيفي البروفيسور ديفيد ليش ينضم الينا من واشنطن اهلا وسهلا بك سيد ليش دعني اسال عن تصريحات الرئيس السوري بشار الاسد حول التطبيع العربي مع دمشق الرئيس السوري يرى ان هذا التطبيع وعوده دمشق الى جامعه الدول العربيه حتى الان لا يزال امر شكلي لا اكثر يعني مثل هذا التصريح يبعث الياس في قلوب السوريين المتواجدين في الداخل السوري اذا لم يكن التطبيع قد غير مصير سوريا الاقتصادي ما الذي ممكن ان يغير الوضع الاقتصادي المتلدي والذي يتسبب الآن بمظاهرات عارمة في السويداء وما هي أهداف هذا التطبيع أصلا؟ Well, the normalization is going to take some time. I mean, Syria is really in no position with 90% of the public under the poverty line with uh, many of their institutions destroyed. The city, the country still uh, somewhat uh, divided uh, to really accept any large-scale aid, uh, not even counting the stringent U.S. sanctions from the Caesar Act of 2020 on Syria. So many countries are going, even though they normalized and reestablished diplomatic relations with Syria, uh, they're going to be hesitant to really engage uh, in any significant way economically or in a business sense because of the threat of, of those sanctions and the, the fact that Syria really just isn't ready to accept the type of aid they really need because of the conditions there. So for the countries that normalized, you know, I think there are a couple of things that are at work, one more systemic and the other a little bit more specific. The systemic reason has to do with not entirely, but in large part with what they perceive as the retreat of the United States from the region. I've talked to a number of uh, Arab Gulf official, officials uh, over the last few years and talking about U.S. foreign policy and the words you hear most most often are that U.S. foreign, US foreign policy is unreliable, unpredictable, uh, and, um, and that the U.S. Uh, is constantly trying to pivot away from the Middle East toward East Asia or, or other problems. And so, as one person, uh, I think, wrote recently, many of these uh, Arab countries, particularly the Arab Gulf countries, the Emiratis, the Saudis, and so forth, are re-regionalizing diplomacy and security uh, in the Middle East because the diplomatic and security architecture has changed with the U.S. not being seen as reliable or as engaged as they have in the past. And so countries such as Saudi Arabia is uh, going its own direction on some things, uh, particularly going through the Chinese to uh, improve relations with Iran, mostly to, to uh, try to, uh, uh, you know, get out of the quagmire in Yemen, uh, as well as some other uh, reasons. Mm -hmm. so, uh, so that's more at a systemic level, that they have to look out for their own particular national interests. At a more specific level, you know, the earthquake created this opportunity for what's been called earthquake diplomacy to engage with Damascus on specific topics, particularly the Captagon drug trade, uh, which is, you know, Syria to some has become a narco state, and therefore and exporting Captagon uh, to other Arab countries, particularly Jordan and the Gulf. And they want uh, to engage with Syria to find ways to, to mitigate this drug trade, in addition to the, the refugee problem, you know, especially Jordan and Lebanon. They want to, uh, you know, return, repatriate the refugees as quickly as, as possible because the stress they're putting on their own economies and Turkey as well is in, involved there. So. For all these reasons, there are specific reasons to engage with Damascus uh, on issues that are, are immediately important, 
uh, but also systemically because the security and diplomatic architecture has changed in the region. نعم سيد ديفيد ولكن مثل ما تعرف يعني دائما هناك عوامل محلية عوامل داخلية تحكم مواقف الدول تجاه أي قضية ومنها القضية السورية وهذا ما حدث في 2011 أصلا كانت هناك حكومات أمريكية منفتحة على الحوار مع النظام السوري نظام بشار الأسد ثم بدأت انتفاضة 2011 وقاطع العالم النظام السوري بعد عدة جرائم ارتكبت على الأراضي السورية هل يمكن أن يحدث هذا من جديد اليوم بعد انتفاضة السويداء هل ممكن أن يؤدي هذا الموقف الغاضب في السويداء وغيرها من الأوضاع الاقتصادية المتردية إلى إعادة نظر وإعادة تقييم لعودة العلاقات العربية والدولية عموما مع دمشق؟ government uh, controlled areas or areas that have that have uh, maintained at least a you know, neutral relationship with uh, uh, the government particularly in Suweda and 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 so forth um but i don't think it's going to change the calculus for arab countries in terms of the level of normalization they're they're willing to engage in at this time which as i said earlier is measured right now it, it's really not much it is you know, mostly symbolic. It's mostly diplomatic symbolism, as Assad pointed out in his recent interview. And I think he, you know, is is uh, was readying or, or preparing his own people for the fact that there's not going to be this immediate uh, um, normalization dividend for the country, that it's going to take a lot of time uh, and, and, and uh, there's not going to be any quick turnaround. And the economy is in, is in terrible shape, as, as we all know. Uh, but also, you know, authoritarian leaders and authoritarian regimes have a way of staying in power, have a way of, of accumulating that wealth which exists uh, to help maintain uh, their existence. And, and you know, as, as someone once said, uh, an authoritarian leader can fail over and over and over, but stay in power as long as there's no significant opposition, as, low as, as long as there's no opposition figures that can compete with uh, the existing uh, the existing ruler. نعم سيد ليش بالتأكيد استمعت للمرشحين الجمهوريين للرئاسة لعام 2024 هل تلمس النية من أي سياسي أمريكي ليس فقط في الحزب الجمهوري لرفع العقوبات عن سوريا هل ممكن أن نتأمل بمسألة رفع العقوبات الأمريكية؟ No, I don't. Not in the immediate term. Uh, I think uh, most, uh, I mean, the United States has kind of been veering away or wanting to at least veer away from the Middle East. Events in the Middle East often bring it back into the region, which is one of the reasons why there's so much question about the reliability of, of the United States. But I don't see the U.S. lifting sanctions. There's just too much popular and particularly congressional support for maintaining the sanctions. And Syria is not that important to any particular administration, whether it be Republican or or democratic to cross Congress uh, or the public uh, on an unpopular issue that could hurt their agenda domestically or in other foreign policy uh, areas. I mean, there was a bipartisan bill introduced uh, shortly uh, after uh, uh, Syria was readmitted into the Arab League, which uh, wants to prevent the Biden administration and presumably any future administration from normalizing relations or recognizing uh, with, with normalizing relations with Syria as long as Assad is still in the power or recognizing Assad as president of Syria and also even to put uh, allow the administration or compel any administration to impose sanctions on countries that do normalize with Syria. So that tends to be the sentiment right now in Congress. And unless Syria rises to the level of import where an administration or a president is willing to take on Congress or the public, I really don't see the sanctions being lifted. Uh, in on mass anytime soon perhaps you know some specific sanctions for specific purposes may be waived by executive order but that's it نعم سيد ليش حضرتك تطرقت إلى محاولة الرئيس الأمريكي السابق دونالد ترامب سحب القوات الأمريكية من شمال شرق سوريا وحتى الآن استطلاعات الرأي تشير إلى ارتفاع شعبية ترامب والجناح الانعزالي في الحزب الجمهوري هل ترى في عودة ترامب احتمالية لسحب القوات أو ما بقي من القوات الأمريكية من شمال شرق سوريا؟ Yeah, that's uh, you know that's mostly with regard to Iran in terms of the Biden administration. 
sending troops uh, to Iraq and to the Gulf uh, region. As far as uh, uh, Syria, the Republican candidates seem to be quite split. I mean, there's the, the Trump side of the equation that uh, really wants to withdraw from, from uh, conflict zones, uh, wants to stop supporting Ukraine against the Russian invasion. And then you saw some other candidates most... ولكن ألا يجب أن تكون سوريا أولوية بالنسبة لأي صانع قرار أمريكي يرغب بالتخفيف من وجود إيران في المنطقة؟ Whether they should focus, whether they can focus, or want to focus is a different equation. The Iranian footprint, as you indicated, is very deep. And I think even the Israelis uh, understand that. And there's no way that we're going to eliminate that. That's one of the reasons the Saudis, you know, they, they finally, I think, realize that uh, to fight Iran and Syria is a lost cause. Let's try to engage with uh, Syria to the point where, you know, it's not uh, uh, where, to a point where they still have some influence. I think the U.S., with regard to Iran and the Gulf, is trying to reestablish its credibility in the Gulf, particularly with Saudi Arabia and with the uh, United Arab Emirates. Syria is really less uh, less uh, important in that regard right now. It was earlier on, but if we were really interested in that, going back to the Obama administration, we would have supported the Syrian opposition much more than we already did. But it was in secret negotiations with Iran over the nuclear deal, as the Biden administration is also doing. So if we put too much pressure uh, in Syria to remove Iran, those negotiations could unravel, which were you know, very important to the Obama administration, maybe less important, but still important to the Biden administration. So I, I don't think that equation in Syria is is that important. But I think, you know, the Republican Party, there's, as you mentioned, I mean, there's wide variety of views on on uh, on foreign policy, isolationism versus, you know, the Trump sort of isolationism versus, you know, he's even talking about putting uh, uh, tariffs on uh, 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 imports in the United States, which is, I think, very, very scary. Uh, but then you have Nikki Haley last night, who's very much an internationalist and represents what's left of the internationalist wing of the Republican Party. And I think she would be someone that that, uh, you know, would continue or certainly be an advocate for continuing the U.S. presence uh, in Syria. سمعنا من المرشحة نيكي هيلي المرشحة الجمهورية لانتخابات الرئاسة 2024 أراء تشجع على تدخل الولايات المتحدة بشكل أكبر في الشرق الأوسط وفي مناطق أخرى حول العالم وهو رأي فريد لا نسمعه كثيرا اليوم من الحزب الجمهوري هل هذا الرأي شعبية اليوم لدى الناخب الأمريكي؟ Yeah, it's difficult to say. I mean, you know, the Trump uh, view on foreign policy and Trump himself tend to dominate, obviously, the the Republican Party, which tend, you know, and that view tends to be much more isolationist, isolationist. Uh, so even in a place like Ukraine uh, and certainly taking on China uh, and, and in that equation, Syria is is way down the list, I think. But there are some members of the Republican Party who and, and you know who still like Nikki Haley, probably Chris Christie, and and uh, a few others that uh, uh, you know feel the U.S. It's essential for the U.S. to play an important international role globally and in the Middle East. So I think uh, you know they would uh, uh, view with favor staying in Syria, but whether they have popular support, probably not. I would say the majority of the Republican Party you know goes with Trump's view on foreign policy. However, that may not play nationally in a general election and whoever's if if trump is the republican nominee or someone like him uh and if you know it could go in a very isolationist way if the the uh, democrats win biden wins again who's much more internationalist although with much more of an emphasis on human rights which has got him in trouble with some of the with some of the uh, gulf uh, arab sheikhdoms uh it would the internationalist view and in, in supporting our our alliances and supporting our partners in the Middle East and outside the Middle East would continue. شكراً جزيلاً لك ضيفي البروفيسور ديفيد ليش كنت معنا من واشنطن. My pleasure. وختاماً شكراً لكل من تابع حلقة اليوم من واشنطن أونلاين. ألقاكم في حلقة جديدة الأسبوع المقبل إلى اللقاء.